Hello, everyone. I really want to, to welcome those who are still signing in and everyone for joining us today at this important discussion. I'd also like to thank the Early Career Professionals and the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committees for their support in putting this event on. They've done a, a whole lot of work to get this organized. I'm Ann Thompson and founder of PetroScience Consultants, and we're the proud sponsor of this event. PetroScience is a partnership and in its current version, focuses on the connections between earth, metals, and people. We're based in Vancouver, Canada, and live and work on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. The film that you hopefully have been had a chance to watch, Picture a Scientist, resonated deeply with us and provides a springboard for deeper discussion within economic geology community and SEG about gender in particular but also larger issues of inclusion and diversity. So one of our, our first female uh, Lindgren fellows, Naomi Oreskes, is now a history professor, so a history of science professor at Harvard, has been writing many, reading a recent book and many columns in Scientific American. And she said recently in one of her columns, and I quote from her, science has an admirable record of producing reliable knowledge about the natural and social world but not when it comes to acknowledging its own weaknesses. And we cannot correct those weaknesses if we insist the system will magically correct itself. It is not ideological to acknowledge and confront bias in science. It is ideological to insist science cannot be biased despite empirical validation to the contrary. Given that our failings of inclusion have been known for a long time, it's high time we finally fix them. So we hope this event helps to further that discussion. We believe at PetroScience, and I'm sure all of you do too, that if we, the better we get at creating a diverse and inclusive work environment, the better results we'll achieve for science, mineral exploration, and the development of responsible mining, which will benefit the planet and human society. But before we get into today's program, I'd just like to point out and highlight some upcoming webinars that are also part of the work that we need to do on subjects important for better workplaces and also for finding the critical minerals needed by society. In particular, next week, April 8th, we'll have building safe and inclusive and respectful spaces through allyship and bystander intervention strategies with Susan Lomas from Me Too Mining. So I really encourage you to register for that as well. So to carry on with our program today, I'd like to introduce to you Aisha Ahmed, who's our moderator from Tech Resources. Aisha is an exploration geochemist with over 10 years experience in both academia and industry. Her current role is as a senior project geochemist with Tech Resources, also based in Vancouver, where she's involved with innovative work across the board. She has a master's from MDRU here in BC and a PhD from CODES in Tasmania, and she's an ardent advocate for diverse teams. So Aisha, all yours, take it away. Thank you uh, very much, Anne. Good afternoon, everyone, uh, or good morning, good evening, depending on where you're joining us uh, from which part of the globe. Uh, I'm really very excited uh, to be acting as moderator today for this event, really facilitating uh, a discussion between our panelists on the, on the theme of gender diversity and inclusion uh, in the geosciences as illustrated in the film, uh, Picture a Scientist. I really hope that today's event inspires discussion, um, not only between our pal panelists, but also uh, with all of you. So the chat function um, that you should see as an option on the bottom of your Zoom screen will be open today. And I'd encourage you to uh, post comments and, and chat amongst yourselves, depending on what we're talking about today. If you have any specific questions, though, questions for the panelists, um, please type those into the Q&A box. That's a separate box from the chat function that uh, should also be located on the bottom of your screen. And we'll get to those questions in a separate Q&A period following the panel discussion. Now, before I introduce the panel, I'd like to warm you all up a little bit uh, by asking you to take part in a quick poll. Uh, so the poll question will appear on your screen shortly. And it's just asking, have you watched uh, the film Picture a Scientist. There's no judgment here. Uh, if you haven't watched the film, that is totally fine. Um, I will answer it myself. 
there we go. And we should see the uh, answers uh, come up shortly here. So even though um, the themes that we'll be talking about today are based broadly on the film, they of course have a much more general uh, application. So if you haven't watched the film, um, no problem there. So we'll just wait for those to show up. Great, okay, so it looks like 77% of you have watched it and 23% uh, haven't. So I'll always try to give a, a little bit of context if, uh, if I'm relating one of the questions for the panel uh, back to the film, for those of you who haven't watched it. All right, so I feel that this is going to be an exceptionally good discussion today because we've brought together a group of people that really represents um, some of the diversity that we see in our current resources sector uh, with regards not only to gender, but age, uh, experience level, geographic location, and ethnicity. So instead of reading out um, extensive biographies on each of our very accomplished panel members, uh, I'm going to call on each of them to introduce themselves briefly and, and tell us why it was important for them uh, to be part of today's event. So Stally, uh, I'll start with you if you can introduce yourself and, and give us some background. Sure, thank you, Aisha. Yeah, I'm Sally Goodman. I'm Global Chief Geologist with Newmont, based out of Denver. And for me, it's important to be here because you know, I unbelievably now have over 40 years as a geologist in academia, in consultancy and in industry. And over that time, you know, I have done my fair share of moaning and grumbling about the treatment of women in geology. But you now that means nothing if I'm not prepared to be part of the solution. So I'm just so grateful to Anne Thompson and, and to the SEG for reaching out and, and asking me to be part of this event. That's great. And we're very lucky to have you today. Um, and we'll move on to you, Steve. Great. Well, look, like, like Sally, it's my great pleasure to be able to join you all today. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a geologist, uh, recently uh, retired uh, from, from Rio Tinto. So I had a large uh, role uh, at the end, uh, essentially, if you wish, a sort of chief technology officer role at Rio Tinto. But I'm, as I said, a geologist by training, I ran uh, Rio Tinto's exploration um, for several years. I'm an explorationist. Um, uh, by by training uh, and have had many you know wonderful experiences having had the privilege to travel all over the world uh, but have seen some really you know poor behaviors and have witnessed some some very you know sad events along the way so being very deeply committed to try and improve you know everything in the in the broader area of inclusion and diversity and, you know, I got to meet Anne and uh, John Thompson in 1988 on an island in Papua New Guinea. Um, so, you know, have had wonderful experiences also along the way, but want, you know, have, have really do want to play my part to help in this journey. So thanks, Aisha. That's great. We're really lucky to have both uh, your and, and Sally's wealth of experience uh, to draw from today. Uh, Nikita, on to you. Hi everyone, my name is Nikita Lucruz. I am a project geologist at Barrick. I, um, I don't have as much experience as Sally and Steve, but in my short time in the field, I've definitely had some less than ideal experiences. And so I'm very happy to be part of this conversation in this event today so that we could you know, start a dialogue to hopefully help us get to where we need to be so that we could continue to bring our whole selves to the jobs and you know, to do the great work that is necessary for us to move society and our field forward. Thanks, Nikita. And we'll definitely dive a little bit deeper into that dialogue in, in the next uh, hour. On to you, Pedro. Hey there, thanks, Aisha. Um, well, my name is Pedro Cordero. I'm an assistant professor in mineral resources at the Pontifical Catholic University of Chile. And that happened after working in the exploration industry for many years, not many, eight years doing global evaluation of mineral projects. I've been in Chile for three years now teaching with um, and living here with my husband. So I guess my contribution here would be my own perceptions of how scientists are being trained now and also uh, a little bit of cultural differences that I observe between, you know, all the places that I have worked with, which I also think it play a role on how 
we are advancing people's careers. That's great. Thank you, Pedro. All right, without any further ado, let's let's kick this discussion off. And I want to start by talking about a really powerful visual um, from the film, and it, it resonated with me. So an iceberg analogy was made for sexual harassment, whereby overt actions um, such as sexual assault and, and sexual coercion are really part of um, public consciousness. That's what gets a lot of media attention. Um, but, you know, that represents the kind of the top of the iceberg. And while these are very serious and, and important aspects of harassment, um, they represent only a fraction of gender focused harassment, the rest of which is generally outside of, of public consciousness. And that's kind of the buried section, the 90% of the iceberg that's beneath the water. So, Sally, I'd like to start with you first. Does this analogy of an iceberg ring true? And can you provide me with some personal examples of maybe this less overt type um, of sexual harassment that you might have experienced? Um, certainly. Um, but underwater part of the iceberg. I mean, I'm lucky that I've, I've never really suffered from the bit of the iceberg that's above water in my professional life, but the underwater part all the time. Um, and some of, the, some of the things are quite trivial, like you know, being the only woman in the field camp, so the guys assume that you're going to make tea for them, um, or something that happens frequently. If I'm traveling with a male colleague, they, people just assume that he's my boss and he gets the better room in the camp and he gets the keys to the truck. And there's things like that there. They're unconscious, there's no malice in them. If you point them out, people generally apologize and, and change the way they behave, but there's then a spectrum to the more intentional, overt comments and behaviors, like you know, rushing from one meeting to another and you're welcomed with, oh, typical woman, always late, or being cut off giving a presentation with, well, women talk too much and you know, move on. And, and, and that sort of behavior, it's just little things, just you know, drip, drip, drip all the time that, that wears you down. And it, it makes it very obvious over time that you're not being accepted as part of the team and you never will be um, because you know, there's not a dumb thing that you can do about it. Um, and, and it's, I guess it's, on its own, that type of behavior is maybe not enough to, to make you leave a company, but you know, from personal experience, I can tell you that it makes the decision to leave a whole heap easier. So as I said in the, in the movie, you know, it's easy to focus on, on the really um, clear examples of, of harassment, but it's what's underneath the water that is perhaps um, the bigger problem that we're going to be discussing here. Absolutely, and and that isn't to take away uh, from some of you know the the top ten percent um, of that of that iceberg that is the more overt forms. And Nikita, maybe you want to talk about um, both of those experiences um, that that you have undergone. Yeah, I um, definitely have, like Sally said fortunately not experienced too much of that upper 10%. But, you know, while working here in Guyana, I've definitely had some unwanted sexual attention, um, you know, because in our society here, like catcalling and all of that is still very common. And so I had an experience when I was an intern, I was working with a field assistant. And one day he looked at me, he was like, you're beautiful. And I said, okay, thank you. Um, how would you like me to use this information? And he like realized it was really awkward. And then he sort of didn't say anything. And then I stopped talking other than to say, okay, we're going to this point next. We're collecting that sample there. And then he apologized and we were able to move forward. I had an experience where last year I was at a mine site. And like Sally said, it was me and another colleague. I was the senior officer there. We were collecting samples. So we had to go to the head of security to get the samples cleared so we could leave. And he looked at my male colleague and said, you know, it's great when you guys come here, you guys should come more frequently and be sure to bring officers who look like her. And so I just sort of got upset and walked out of the room. Um, but yeah, in my experiences in the US um, were more of the type where someone would look at my last name, for instance, and profile me. And so I actually had a reviewer one time 
um, respond to a paper that I submitted. And his response was that the native English speakers on the paper should take some time to teach me the first author how to write properly. And so it was hard to swallow because among other things, like I'm a native English speaker, Guyana is the only English speaking country in South, in South America and that's where I'm from. So I speak English, but then also none of the comments that you gave sort of addressed those really bad language errors that were present in the paper. I mean, there weren't any because he clearly didn't, you know, address them, but it's just, you know, that type of thing where people feel like it's okay to do something like that. I also had one time this one professor at a university looked at me and after telling him what my background was, told me that I would never make it as an economic geologist. So after finishing my PhD, I wanted to email him to say, hey, remember when you said, but then I figured it, it wasn't worth it. So I just let it go. Um, and, you know, just like Rachel Burke says, these are things you can kind of hold on to and to try and use them as fuel to sort of spite them. It's like, you're not going to run me out of this because I deserve to be here. And so, yeah, that's sort of what I've been doing. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for that. I mean, Steve, maybe I'll ask you in your your career, uh, have you seen an evolution on maybe um, the type of media attention that's been drawn from maybe starting from the more overt types of, of harassment and then more attention being drawn to these less overt types uh, over the years? Look, I, th I think there's there's no doubt about that. You know, when I when I started um, my career, you know, it was into if you would say a very traditional employment world, uh, everyone that uh, was around me in terms of leadership were were male. You know, I, um, you know, and I, I think notwithstanding that, though, they were as inclusive as they probably could be at that time. Could be expected to have been uh, at that time. You know, when I graduated, our head of department in geology was a female professor. My co-master sponsor was female, so for me, there was this was not you know uh, unusual. It's it's what you reflect later on uh, as you as you move forward. I would say the very senior executives in the company, from observation looking backwards, were were dinosaurs, and I saw them um, you know demonstrate many of those things that we've said here. Uh, one um, I recall brought, you know, brought his uh, son to a field project and asked, you know, the, the, the female to look after him. She happened to be the project leader. Um, so, you know, that, that, so we've seen, you know, those things through time. I, I haven't witnessed that recently. I think that evolution uh, of, of thinking the more inclusive society, as we said, that, that iceberg is alive and well. Um, but I think the more obvious things have now been uh, to, to a degree uh, pushed to, to, to one side. And for me, in the last um, few years, having, you know, been, uh, having the privilege to lead uh, Rio Tinto's work in family and domestic violence, you know, we've done an enormous amount on education and upfront and talked about bystander training and these kinds of things. So I think there's some very powerful things that we can do and send some very strong signals both gender, you know, the whole inclusion and diversity um, journey. So I, I guess my reflection is it's a journey. Uh, we're on it. I think it's accelerating. There's lots of things that have prompted that in the recent time. And, and, and therefore, I think it's, uh, it's great to have this, this, this panel talk today. Yeah, and I, I enjoyed it. I think one of the um, members of the film or actors in the film indicated that, you know, there is change happening. It's just not happening fast enough. So we're here to uh, accelerate that, you know, as part of this, this discussion. Uh, Pedro, I'll, I'll maybe give you um, some time if you wanted to comment on um, your experience as a younger, you know, generation uh, male uh, working in South America, what have been your experiences? Uh, I see such a strong change in the last 10, 10 years ish, 10, 15. It's when I finished my undergraduate in 2006, I remember vividly having this feeling of seeing all my female colleagues and finishing undergraduate with me. And oftentimes they had better grades, they're more or something, or you no, know, they would be more competent in certain fields and that kind of feeling. But the general perception, including my own at the time, 
is that I felt I'm, I feel so lucky not to be a woman. That, that, that's how I felt at the time. Um, because um, the, pers- the industry would, at the t- that time, would, they would actively tell you, we don't hire women. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't think this is okay anymore. I, I'm not sure if it still happens or if it's just one of those veiled contracts that there is, are still ongoing, you know, especially in Brazil that where, um, and, and it's funny how, how these things work because for example, if you are an exploration manager and then you're worried to hire a female geologist because she'll be in the field with assistants, well, hire proper assistants that will take care of your female geologist instead of worrying, you know? So it's like, and one thing I noticed back back when I used to work in the industry was how damaging it was for me as a man as well and for my colleagues, this, this um, environment where it was okay to have bad field assistants that would do things to women, even though there were no women in, in the area. It was just like this general culture where, you know, um, um, it's... I, I will not invest on proper training on people or on hiring people that are decent human beings. I mean, you cannot put it like that, but that's the general perception I had at the time. And that led me to eventually dropping out of a couple of jo- uh, jobs because I felt the atmosphere was so toxic. Um, for example, when I used to work in some mine sites, I also felt the mine sites that had more women were the mine sites where the atmosphere was much better. And I could never understand why. And I think it's this whole structural and better, I think, from, from my point of view, right? I felt like it was less stressful. I felt uh, the demands were, were uh, put out in a clearer way. And now looking back, I think it's this. I think it's like if your work environment um, includes, it's inclusive, includes women, includes people of color, and it has this general, um, more appropriate um, for 2021, <laughs> you know, and it's going to be better for you, male geologist as well, you know. So this is an argument I, I always discuss with students and, and uh, colleagues as well, because I think it, it, it affects all of us. Agreed. Absolutely. So we've heard from uh, our panelists now on this question, uh, but now I'd like to ask you, uh, the audience, for for your uh, opinion and your experiences. So it's time for another poll. Uh, So this is poll question number two. Uh, Have you ever experienced the less obvious forms of sexual harassment described in the films and, and by our panelists? And, you know, perhaps this isn't just related to gender. We're talking about um, here gender and diversity inclusion. So it could be, you know, sexuality, um, ethnicity, um, language, you know, we, we can open this up to, to a more general comment. And we'll just wait here a few seconds for, for our results. And I have a feeling I'm going to anticipate that we're going to see that a lot of people, even though we probably have uh, a, a lot of men on the call, not just uh, women, that we're going to see uh, a lot of people responding that yes, they have experienced um, this kind of less overt sexual harassment. I know I certainly have. And there you go, almost 90% of our audience members uh, have experienced this kind of, of harassment. So obviously something uh, that we need to be focusing on um, in the future. All right, so let's move on to another theme that cropped up uh, throughout this film, which was the concept of allies, and in particular, male allies. So in the film, we hear about um, this appalling harassment that was experienced by Jane Willenbring uh, on a field expedition to Antarctica. And it happened at the hands of her academic supervisor. So somebody who was meant to be responsible for her well-being and safety. And one of the other members of the field party who went down to Antarctica, Adam Lewis, he recounts his regret uh, at not standing up to the professor and, and really taking a stand when the harassment was taking place. So Pedro, I'll, I'll start with you. We ended with you. Um, I'm going to put a little bit of pressure on you right now. So as an early career geoscientist, um, 
how do we stop this cycle of regret and looking to the past? And how do we start the cycle of action among younger men? So I, I had to think very hard about, you know, okay, so I learned all of this important things with the documentary and I feel like this documentary really helped me fill in some gaps on, on my own knowledge or lack of, uh, especially when it comes down to um, the biases that you have, you know, to me, sexual harassment was something that was always like the tip of the iceberg. And, but there is this whole thing underneath that it's all this micro actions that, um, that really influence someone's life. And that example that was in the, um, in, the, in the documentary is very similar to what a couple of now friends, but students that are working with me, they, they have went through with their former supervisor. And they are not in the in my university, but I, initially they approached me asking for help with um, technical aspects of the thesis. And then I was like, you know, we're chatting and discussing, and then they invited me to be part of the papers and whatnot. And then slowly they started opening up about all these situations of harassment that they were going through with their supervisor, the same person. And he used to be a friend of mine. So I remember this point when he, they were telling me these things and I, I was still trying like, okay, so let me focus just on the technical aspect of their work because th what they want is to actually finish their PhD masters. And then there was a shift after I talked to my husband about the situation where he told me that, but I, aren't you gonna do anything about the person that's harassing? And then I was like, you know, it, it was this moment of, it took me a while to, to realize, look, actually I'm, you know, I'm seeing this happening. Uh, I'm hearing their um, narratives and I'm not taking that into account as part of the problem. And then um, they themselves decided not to come forward with the, the problems. They just decided to, to switch um, supervisors. And uh, I'm still helping one of them. The other one, we, we finished everything. It's just, and I'm seeing in contact with them to try to understand, you know, how I can help better. But this situation kind of stumbled up on me. You know, I was, I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. And um, one thing that I noticed is that if companies or if universities, they say that they want to tackle this issue, the issue of, you know, women dropping out of science, women dropping out of fields, you, you have to see if those companies, universities or governments, if they are spending money to solve the issue. Because for example, uh, I did a little bit of a dig to see what Stanford is doing about harassment, you know, and they created this harassment um, uh, office where people are trained to do that and, and trained to, to try to tackle this issue. Um, but if, if we have, entities, they are not putting money into solving this issue. It means they don't really care about it. I think that's a really indicative. And what I thought in terms of action is to try to pressure these entities into creating uh, an entity, an office that will discuss diversity and that will uh, receive this, these people. They are being bullied or they are being harassed and help them. So there should be a very clear path. If you are being harassed, your institution should have a very clear path of what you need to do. And I think that's that's the way that we can solve those things institutionally. Yeah, I mean, that's a great, um, a, re a really tangible outcome and, and solution. And and I do agree that, uh, you know, for, for many companies, it's um, money is where your mouth is or whatever that saying is, <laughs> right? And so, and so for many companies, if you're not putting money towards something, um, it, it often is a reflection of, of how serious you're, you know, taking the issue. Um, so Sally, and we're, we'll switch perspectives here uh, a little bit. What does having an ally mean to you? Does that always have to be a male ally? I mean, something we haven't talked about is female allies, but I'll ask you that general, general question. No, I mean, an ally is simply somebody who will stand up and, and support you and speak on your behalf if, if you're in a position where you don't feel that you can speak up for yourself. Um, there's a great phrase in, in the film that you know, correction requires action. Um, you know, it's not enough to, to say that you're an ally and you support diversity and inclusion. You actually have to, to do 
something about it. And it was a bit disappointing in the film, you know, Adam is, is full of regret that he didn't say anything, um, but he didn't say anything. He didn't speak <laughs> up when he could have done. Um, and, you know, I, I think we've probably all been in a situation where you're in a meeting, big group of people, and somebody makes some sort of off color remark or, or joke that targets somebody at the table because of their gender or orientation or the color of their skin. And instead of speaking up, everybody immediately looks over at that person. And you know, they're maybe not reacting, they're looking down, perhaps they've got a bit of a smile on their face, but because they don't react, everyone goes off. Oh, you know, they don't mind. Well, you know what? If you think they mind, they, they do mind. But they've already been targeted. Now everybody's looking at them. It's doubly difficult for them to be the one to say anything. So then it, it's, it's up to everybody else just to say, well, hold on. You know, that comment is not appropriate in this forum. And just, just close it down. Just make the point that you know, whoever it is cannot say that sort of thing. And, and it, it's going to be uncomfortable, but it means that's really what being an ally is all about. It's, it's stepping up. Um, on on somebody's behalf and and letting them know that there's someone else on their side. And sometimes those moments go past so quickly that you go, man, I should have said something. Well, um, again, don't let it go. There's, there are things that you can do afterwards. You know, go and talk to that person and, and don't put it all on them. You know, say, that comment made me feel very uncomfortable in that meeting. You know, does that happen often? Open, open the conversation, let them tell you, you know, how they're feeling about it. Um, that's, like I said, that, you know, yeah. correction requires action. That's what, what being an ally is. It's the doing rather than just thinking. And being comfortable with discomfort, you know? <laughs> yes, because you know, we're, not, we're not going to change things just by sitting around talking about it. Um, we, it, it is going to require action, and some of that is going to take people well out of their comfort zones, for sure. Yeah, I mean, Steve, um, uh, coming from a position where you're, you know, you were a, a group executive, um, are, are there ways that people can approach uh, someone, you know, of your standing, uh, how, a, a way that is direct, but, um, you know, still respectful? Can you provide any guidance on that? So look, I mean, absolutely. But maybe the first thing I, I should say is, you know, Sally raised uh, that that issue about joke telling, and so something I did tell tell you, uh, told you uh, when we met earlier was uh, a female geoscientist who's still still within uh, Rio Tinto, you know, came to me, uh, and uh, you know, I was quite well known for for joke telling, recently adept at it, and uh, said, you know, that was inappropriate. Um, and, and it made me reflect exactly as Sally said about, you know, the, the listening party. So as opposed to the sort of camaraderie that you're trying to build through sort of storytelling and telling those things, it was to actually reflect on, well, the target of them. And I think, you know, that therefore it, on that day, you know, my, my joke telling career ended uh, because, you know, I realized, well, a joke is always at someone or something's expense. Um, and I just never had framed uh, the issue that way. I think in terms of, you know, the other one about, um, uh, it, it, as you said, can you approach senior people? At the end of the day, we're all human. Um, and, you know, I think there are times when you, you will find that you may have a much more receptive hearing um, from, from people to raise these, these issues. We get far too caught in the procedures and the hierarchies and uh, all of these sort of symbols, I, I think, of, uh, of organizations uh, and you know, that, that sort of hierarchical leadership piece. Best conversations I've ever had have been with people who respectfully but very firmly have made it clear uh, to me that they have an opinion on any number of different issues. And they'd like you as a leader to lean into this or to at the very least to understand their position uh, in this but seek support and, uh, um, and some of those, you know, are doing wonderful work. Again, as, as Pedro said, I would, I would agree, the last 10 years has been really amazing. When we think about, uh, you know, how many issues are now out on the table, 
but you know, senior leaders, you know, and look, sort of like me, you know, white male, have had all of those privileges. Often have not had the the benefit of being able to dig deeply into these issues and really learn and understand the context and get a different point of reference. Um, and so I think people engaging on these subjects is incredibly powerful. And in my other observation is that the best teams I have ever worked with have all been teams that are diverse in all of the dimensions of di diversity. Uh, and there are no doubt, you know, the, the best field geologists I've ever worked with, you know, uh, were, were in Zimbabwe. Uh, the best, you know, the most gender diverse team I worked with was in, was in Spain. You know, where the majority of our female geoscientists were fe well, the majority of our geoscientists were female, successful project. And you go, you know, later on and reflect on all of these, these data points, you say, well, gee, whiz, why don't we just do this as routine? You know, what you know, why why in 2021 are we having to work out how to make this work? Um, but we are where we are. It is accelerating, and as you said, Asia, you know what, what today is about is to try and accelerate uh, the pace of change, bring those perspectives in. But there's no doubt that the more diverse and inclusive we are, uh, the better uh, we are as people, and the better the results will be, no doubt. Yeah, so I, I want to touch on something um, that, that you said about, you know, the, the diverse team uh, and how important that is. And, and one of the themes of the, the film was about this, this concept of the leaky pipeline. How do we maintain diverse teams, um, not just, you know, at the undergraduate level when, when we've got a bunch of students um, entering into STEM fields. And, and at that level, it's generally kind of a 50-50 split. But you know, there's this trend and it doesn't matter if it's academia or whether um, you know, it's in industry, but as we move into more senior positions, um, the female representation um, decreases significantly. So maybe on that, I'll, I'll um, ask our audience members, this is our last poll uh, of the day, and we'll just get that question up on the screen. Um, and that is in your company or your organization, uh, are senior management positions, and that might be professors, um, CEOs, chief geoscientists, are those uh, represented equally between men and women? This is anonymous, just so you know. And I think it is, it is getting better. I know this is something that's very true to my heart. Um, I have a, a seven-year-old boy. My husband is also a professional. Um, and I started out in an undergraduate program with equal men and women. Um, but as you move up and, you know, women have families and children, um, that often decreases uh, significantly around my age group, um, you know, as often where it happens. So definitely a subject close to my heart. So let's see what the results are here. Okay, so 25% are saying yes, um, there is equal representation, which is great. Uh, but the vast majority is saying no, we still haven't reached that point where um, we have, you know, as many Sally Goodmans as we do um, Steve McIntosh's, you know, so hopefully that is the goal uh, in the future. And so Nikita, I'll ask you somebody who's just graduated, um, with a PhD, you've just been in academia. Did you see this reflected uh, in your institution, this kind of representation? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's at Michigan, it was like you said, uh, we started with 50-50 male, female. And then for graduate students, um, there's actually more female grad students than males. But then when you look at faculty, there the ratio of male faculty to female faculty is about two to one. And so I think ultimately we have to start asking questions about why people leave. For me, I left academia because I only got a PhD because I wanted to learn enough geology so that I could work in the industry, right? And so I finished my PhD and I left. But I know for some other people, it's, you know, not wanting to deal with what they feel like is very, cut, like, you know, the very cutthroat nature of the academy and, you know, just getting really bad reviews and then competing for uh, grant money that's dwindling. 
um, and all of those all of those things. So I think we'd have to start having conversations around figuring out why people leave. I saw someone in the Q and A was asking if when people leave a position, right, there's an exit interview where you try to get at what was the root cause of that leak of you know that person leaking or leaving and you know enhancing that leaky pipeline scenario. So I think that's definitely somewhere. Um, that we need to start focusing some of our energies to sort of figure out what the root of the problem is so that we could um, come, come up with a solution for it. Yeah, that's, that's great. I mean, what about um, Sally when it comes to field geology? I think you have um, some ideas on, on how we can retain more female um, field geologists, because obviously this is a big problem with rotations and working away if you have a family or, or you know, if you don't. Yeah, I, I think the first thing we have to do is start making up women's minds for them. Um, you know, I've heard frequently people say, well, she's got a young family now, so she won't go, want to go back to fly in, fly out. Or, well, I've heard so-and-so's pregnant, so we better not put them in the field team. No, let, if a woman's put herself forward for a position, then she's already thought about those aspects and she's still willing to to do the job. And I think this goes for other people who are maybe put themselves forward for a job where culturally they might be going to have a difficult time. You know, they've already thought about that. So let's, you know, that's the first thing. Let's not make up people's minds for them. Um, the, the other thing I guess is, is right now with the pandemic, you know, we're, we're doing this big experiment in, in mining about how we can run our minds with far fewer people at the mine site um, because of, of COVID protocols. So the one thing that we've done is, is there's no more shared accommodation. So that's you know, one excuse that people often find about not having women in the field is, well, you know, it's all shared accommodation at camp. Well, that's not an excuse anymore because that's just evaporated overnight. And because there's less camp capacity, um, people are, are now, our geologists are now doing a lot of their work from home or from a local office. So perhaps, and, and they're still working very effectively. You know, as a geologist, you do have to go and see the rock sometime, but maybe you don't need to be at site every rotation. Um, and it's very different if you have a young family finding childcare for say six days a month compared to four days a week. So, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that some of these changes will outlast the pandemic and will benefit not, not just women, but um, all of our geologists, because, you know, young dads like to see their kids grow up too. It's not just the mums. Of course. They're interesting times, but I'm, as I say, I, I hope this, this different worldview that's been forced on us, I, I think it's actually very healthy for the industry to, to look at different ways of, of working there. Absolutely. I mean, um, I, I do want to get to the questions here. I am conscious of time. Um, and there's actually one question that uh, was, was popped into the chat accidentally, but it's very relevant to, to what we're talking about. It's from Dan Gregory. And I'm going to aim this at you, Pedro. Um, it's about how we actually um, get more women into STEM. And so it, it's kind of been my understanding that at, at the undergraduate level, it is generally 50-50, uh, but, but Dan's saying um, at his university, the undergraduate programs tend not to mirror the diversity of society very well. And, and how do we fix this? So do you see this at, at your institution? Yeah, so I, I, I actually teach for mining, mining engineers. So it's even less women than back in my original university because I studied geology. So the ratio of women that starts in my in my school of engineers 30 percent and that's considered very high already for stem at least in chile i'm not sure how it compares to the states uh and you know they're very proud of it and it's been like slowly increasing slowly increasing over time but there is still this challenge i i do not have an answer for that i think there is a system systemic way on how we raise our boys and our girls i think we teach girls that you know anything that has to do with caring to someone that's awesome and we don't teach boys that so if you look most of the jobs that attract women are jobs that take caring you know we have to care about the person so let's say three easy ones nursing psychology and teaching and like something we're doing something very wrong 
with the boy side of it. It's like, how come we're not teaching them to care and they're not choosing those professions? So there should be more mingling. So I think it's such a structural issue and how, how we can um, help our girls to, to choose those fields probably comes from not uh, um, attacking them when they try to be a bit more uh, or either or aggressive, like assertive, right? Or when they like trying to climb trees and be more loud and, and messy, that's also an expression of creativity, but also more like, you know, any act of creation is an act of destruction. So like if we, if we, we tell our girls not to be th that, so we're curbing a bit of what takes to, to create as well. Um, so sorry, I don't have an answer for that. But you can't solve problems. all the world's problems. Uh, that, that's all right. We'll let that go <laughs> for today. Um, totally agreed, though. It starts very, very early. You know, it starts um, when they're babies and, and we teach them uh, how to act, you know. So this is not something that's starting when kids are in their last year of high school and they have to decide what they, what they want to do uh, at university. So, all right, because we are running short on time, I am going to um, start asking some questions and I'm going to leave this open so I won't direct um, direct these questions at, at any one panelist in particular, if that works, unless you all start talking over each other. Uh, and so anyone who's who's ready can answer. So our first question here, and these were all voted on, so this is a question that's that's gotten the most votes. When female geologists leave um, slash quit? Oh, we've already had that one. Okay. Um, actually, maybe Steve, do you want to comment on that? Um, as somebody, I don't know if you would have um, dealt with that HR side of things. Do you get data on why people leave and, and specifically with respect to women? Look, we, we, we did, but I, I would have to say, you know, exit interview process uh, can be a, a somewhat mechanistic um, thing, you know, what, what, what are you really trying to learn? You know, is, is it a process or is it really truly uh, a learning opportunity? And we tried to change that over the last few years to make it less an HR thing and much more a company uh, issue uh, to, to dig into that. But I, I think going back to some of those earlier comments about the, the leaky pipeline, the, the, the simple reality is you, you do need to put money towards it um, because you know you have these decision points if if let's just take one of the reasons which would be the family uh, issue you know this is uh, an enormously complex uh, area and you know at its at its heart invariably is care um, and so how how do you to your point Tisha, manage you know a dual career family and deal with the issues required to you know, to care for the children, taking that one example. And, and the reality is, you know, the companies need to stump up the money for childcare. Um, and until we do that, uh, we're not going to, to, to make the progress that we need around that one issue. And I think being very deliberate about it. And, and the other side to the equation is it can't just be seen as a cost. You know, there has to be the value side to the equation. Why do we need to do that? So you need to list out all of the positive attributes about what I will get by having an inclusive and diverse team with this broad range of experience and different perspectives uh, that, that you know, come into our organization and help us. And to Sally's point, COVID has told us that many of the reasons that we have given forever about why you, these things just won't work, I just don't, they don't add up anymore. Technology has now moved to the point where, where we, we are now able to, to deal with you know, these, these issues in a very different way to, to any time in the past. So again, I, I think if we keep looking for excuses, we'll find them. If we look for the solutions, they're there. And, uh, and so for me, that, that, that's really the, the key. So going back to the exit interview, therefore, if you take that perspective into it around the framing, I think you'll have a much richer conversation, but I don't think that's what happens today. Good to know. All right, we'll move on to um, another question. Uh, this one's from Stephanie Mills. Thank you, Stephanie. Following on from how to end discriminatory behavior going forward, what are the thoughts on addressing past discrimination, particularly those that may have uh, ongoing financial, professional, or emotional repercussions, as was the case for Jane in the film? 
So do you just move past it, um, put the past in the past, or you know how far back do you go, and and what are the consequences um, for the aggressors? Uh, can I comment on it real quick, please? Because I, I, I'm going through this with these two friends of mine, and uh, the mental load of imagining yourself suing that person and not seeing anything happen. Like in the, the documentary, you saw that the guy basically got a three-year leave and then he was bound to come back to the university. It's so, it's like, it's such, after everything you went through, after showing people, you know, so I do not at all like blame anyone for not wanting to come forward because this is such a complicated issue and the system and I, I saw that so many times in universities i'm not sure in companies steve and sally if, and nikita if it's the same but the system sort of protects itself not because like more passively it's like uh, uh tomorrow no so it's like it's very hard to go beyond this you know uh, meta stable area of like into something active so it's it's that's that's where the that's where the problem actually is thanks did anybody else want to comment on that otherwise we'll move on to the next one all right uh so uh, this is from isaac simon there's an unfortunate amount of people in our industry that do not empathize um with this issue or, or they don't care or they don't see it as a problem. Um, you've all discussed the velocity at which diversity or gender diversity is increasing rather slowly and our need to increase this rate. Getting more people on board with diversity focused initiatives um, will help to increase this rate. So I guess the question is, you know, here on this panel, we're, we're largely probably preaching to the converted people who are interested, people who have decided to sign on um, to this panel and, and to listen to this discussion. How do we get the people who are not interested currently? I, 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 I oh, oh, go ahead, Sally. I was just going to say, I think a good point was made in the documentary about looking at the data and that you know, people can individually say that in their career they haven't experienced it but they can't deny that it happens because the data is there to show that it happens and i think that's really important you know we're all scientists putting that information in front of people and and it's incontrovertible um, you know, maybe the data just isn't isn't as widely available or as widely known as it, it could be, but but you can't argue against against what the um, the data shows. Oh, look, I I would agree absolutely with that, and and the other one is um, to you know as as a leader, I guess to a degree to force the issue. So to have, and I know that there can be, you know, all sorts of different reactions to this, but to bring people into your organization that have that different perspective, have that experience, um, you know, poor in some cases and great in, in others, and to be able to talk around, well, what did they see and observe around these kinds of issues? So as I said, you know, one of the things I'm very proud about with, with Rio Tinto was, was in the work that we did on family and domestic violence, which started in Australia and, it, and then went uh, much broader around the world. And when we started into that, I really had no idea. Uh, about the multidimensionality of all of these issues. It then very quickly takes you from family and domestic violence as, as the outcome of the inputs to things like um, mental health uh, issues, things like, you know, uh, uh, substance abuse, uh, you know, things like, as we've said here, um, inequality in all of its forms that then thrive drive a, a human or mental health response that leads to very unfortunate things. Um, and, and so, you know, it was a long, slow process to build a toolkit uh, that, that, I guess, allowed people to be more proactive. And as I said, you know, earlier, you're going to do bystander training. It's one of the most powerful things that we, that we did, because a lot of people, to Pedro's point, well, what can I really do? I'm just, I'm just me. But actually, if everyone, you know, says, well, I can't do anything, it's just me versus, you know, as many people as can do their little bit, the dripping water on the stone, we will have an impact. 
and I think we we have to take this on. Um, but I agree, we, we, we probably are here in this group talking to the converted, but I think it's to go out in any way that we can and try and engage around these, these issues uh, more broadly outside of this group. Absolutely, and to, to have a united, united front. Um, oh, did you want to say something, Pedro? Yes, uh, just a parenthesis on what Sally said about data. Data is incredible, and like we saw in the documentary, it's the only way that you can actually prove things. But I've also seen some studies where if presented with data that conflicts with your worldview, you immediately just shove it to the side and just ignore what the data is saying. And so it's like we get like, so what can we do? You know, if, if the only thing that we can do, which is prove that this issue is real, women are, you know, being left out um, and the data is here and the people in power do not believe it. I think the only, th uh, the only thing that solves it is putting people in power that actually care. Agreed. Absolutely. All right. So in the interest of time, we're going to ask one more question uh, and then we'll get to, to our final statements here. And that question is, do the panelists think that tackling harassment, bullying, discrimination, et cetera, should it be the job of the employer or do societies like the SEG have a role to play? I think everyone has a role to play. Right? I think this is something where we need all hands on deck in order to move forward. I think, as was said previously, we're here probably just you know preaching to the converted, but hopefully we all go back to our individual spaces and we can stand up and be allies you know, and continue to do this work to ensure that we are creating spaces that are inclusive and diverse, you know, where you know, we can get the best minds together to work on these difficult problems that we're trying to solve. Thanks, Nikita. Anybody else? The SEG? All right, uh, then I will pass it over and I'll just get, give everybody 30 seconds, please be mindful of time, um, to give maybe just some forward looking statements. Uh, what do you think is the most um, important next steps uh, in this gender and, and diversity uh, inclusion um, struggle, you know, that we have uh, in, in our workplaces uh, and our companies. So maybe Steve, we'll start with you. Look, I, I, I think I just really re restating what I, what I said, you, you know, we, it's that whole issue, you know, uh, you need to see what you can be. So the, the companies need to redouble their efforts to put people in positions of power that uh, cover the full spectrum uh, of inclusiveness and diversity. And only then, and, and being very clear that, uh, that the, these people are there, you know, by, by, by merit, but, you, you know, also that there's, no, there's nothing stopping them from moving out to do those tasks, nothing, you know, that we've broken down those, those barriers, we've dealt with, as Pedro said, those biases that, uh, uh, that, you know, work in a very insidious way uh, to sort of perpetuate um, the, the, the current state. And I think for, for many, you know, uh, people in, in uh, senior roles, they've been brought up in a very paternalistic world. And we need to move well beyond that. So they think they're doing good things. They don't understand actually that they're sending in many cases exactly the wrong signals out through, through their words and deeds. Um, so, you know, I, I think we're, we're on a pathway. It's the trend is, is, is in the right direction, but the slope is not. And we need to think really carefully about how we can put that acceleration point in. And societies like the SEG have a role to play. Every part of society has a role to play. So this is not just a company issue. It's not just a government issue. Uh, this is a full court press of all of society leaning into, into these issues. But I, I, you know, I think it's an exciting moment in time. Uh, and we need to be somewhat radical agents uh, as we move forward. Thanks, Steve. And how about you, Nikita? Leave us with some parting words. I'd just like to say thanks to Anne and you know everyone in the society for putting this on. 
and I just hope that you know we can all reflect on the conversations that we've had here and everyone do their small part to help us move this forward you know and make our society um, more inclusive and a more safe space for everyone. Thank you I hope so too. Pedro how about you? Uh, I think from, from my side, at least, what my takeaways from here are that if I want to help with the change, I have to pressure my institution into two questions. One is, do you care about diversity and inclusion? And two is, how much money is allocated to tackle the issue? In that order. <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to spook a lot of people. Uh, because, again, like Steve also mentioned, you know, if you follow the money, you're going to follow the intentions. And then if there is an intention to help, there should be money allocated for that. And then there should be whatever measurement the specialists think is better for it, for tackling diversity issues. Yeah, agreed. You need tangible dollars on the problem. Sally, last comments of the panel. Um, yeah, I think it, it's up to us all to look for the opportunities, not just to wait until something comes across your desk and, and say, well, yes, you know, this is a good thing to support. Get out ahead of it and, and actually look for the opportunities to increase diversity on all of our teams. Um, because as Steve said, you know, that it's going to make a stronger team and a, a stronger business. Um, but I am, I am like, very optimistic um, that I think the fact that we can have a meeting like this and have so many men call in um, is, is really nice that people are willing to listen to, to what we have to say. And it's not seen as some terrible, you know, radical feminist agenda, which is what it would have been seen back in the 80s. So, you know, we're, we're definitely on the right track and, and I'm very optimistic about the direction we're going in because you know, after all, it, it basically it, it, it's about treating everyone with, with respect, you know, treating everyone the way that you want to be treated, whether they look like you or not. That's great. That's a, this is a great way to end on, on such a positive and a hopeful note. Uh, so a final thanks to all of our panelists uh, for their participation and, and their insights today. Also, thank you to the audience. Uh, you've provided some great questions and I apologize that we couldn't get to all of them. Uh, we'll need to have a three hour session as our, at our next uh, uh, seminar and maybe have more questions. That's a learning, uh, more time for questions than, than even discussion. And I'll just pass on uh, over to Anne for some closing remarks. Thank you, Aisha. And thank you, everyone. Um, I'm still feeling some emotion from some of your stories. And I'm sure that a lot of the people who've been listening in have heard things that have brought up their own memories or experiences. So take care of yourselves today. Um, but also remember this conversation and keep it with you as we move forward and, and the work that needs to be done. So thank you to Steve McIntosh, to Sally Goodman, to Nikita La Cruz, to Pedro Cordero, to Aisha Ahmed. Um, I can hear the applause echoing from all the attendees and their heartfelt thanks for doing this. I also would like to remind everybody, Steve brought up the importance of bystander training. We do have a webinar coming up on April 8th and the details of that should be showing here shortly for you. So please, I encourage you, um, even if you think you would be fine in a bystander situation, research shows that we don't always do what we think we would do. And training, as with anything, is really, really important. Um, and with that, thank you to SEG and again to the Early Career Committee and to the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee for helping with this. And everyone, have a great day. And we'll see you again soon, I hope. Thank you.